Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explain. So as we are hurtling now into 2024, it's time to look at what would be a good Linux distro for you to use in this year. If you're a beginner, I've got some suggestions for you. If you're a bit more of an expert, I've got some suggestions for you. We're going to look at all the popular distros and try to help you pick one that let you dangle your feet in the whole Linux thing, including some ways that you can try it without necessarily destroying or overwriting everything in your main computer. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay then, let's get cracking. The best Linux distros of 2024. So what is a Linux distro? Now a desktop operating system, doesn't matter whether that's Windows or Linux or Mac OS or any other desktop operating system that has been in the past is made up of different parts. And this really is, you know, a, 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 an executive summary. Of course, it's a bit more detailed than this, but you're gonna need the core of the OS, which is called a kernel in this case, the Linux kernel. And I have several videos here on this channel about what is a kernel, what is a Linux kernel. You can check those out. You're gonna need the desktop environment itself. So something that has, you know, Windows and mouse support and you can move things around. And then that also implies a way to write programs for that desktop environment. So an app developer can create whatever app it needs. So there's gonna be some uh, APIs and some graphical toolkits and ways of doing that. There's a set of underlying services. These are just a few, there are much more than this. Networking, graphics, audio, security updates, all these things need to be part of the, uh, the desktop operating system. And then on top of that, you need the user applications. So whether that's a web browser or a word processing suite or a game, okay? And there needs to be a way to install those. And of course, the way that Windows install things is different to the way that Mac OS install things. On Mac OS, you just drag generally an application from the uh, archive directly into the applications folder. In Windows, there's normally some kind of a setup program that you double click and then you, you go through the various steps and it installs it. How does that happen on, on Linux? So a Linux distro distribution, that's what distro means, is a mix and match of all of those different things because there's not just one of each of those things. In fact, there are lots of different versions. So there's a version of the Linux kernel. So uh, there are long-term support versions, there are bleeding edge versions, there are versions that have got, you know, bespoke backport patches that a particular Linux distro might want to include. So it's not just, although there is the official Linux kernel that gets published uh, and Linus, you know, releases that, that's never what you get in a Linux, Linux distro. There's always something uh, different about it. Often the main thing is whether it's going to get long-term support or not. And then, of course, there are the desktop environments. And there are a whole bunch of them, maybe 20 or so of them. GNOME, KDE, Mate, LXQT, XFCE are some of the popular ones. Uh, but there are others. So there are the way you write a program with GNOME, the toolkit, the APIs is different to the ones with KDE. KDE itself is based on QT, Q, so you've got LXQT. So there's always different ways of writing uh, these desktop apps. They come with their own APIs, their own desktop toolkits. Now, the only good news is, is that most Linux distributions include the libraries for the major ones, which means if a particular app is written for a particular desktop, it will still probably run because it can call the right libraries to bring up the window. But underlying, the way you write a GNOME program, the way you write a KDE program, they're, they're, they're very different. And then you need a way to install security updates. So that means that the people providing the Linux distro need to have a mechanism in place for actually providing those security updates. So that's not just the Linux kernel, you know, the desktop itself, little programs like a zip program or an editor or the web browser, they all get updated when there are security issues found. So how does that get handled through the Linux distro? The smaller the distro, the less popular it is, the less people working on it. If it's a hobby one, then there are gonna be less people, less time given over to providing uh, these updates. If it's a big name one, then there are gonna be more resources available for providing those updates. Then on top of that, you need a way to actually install the application. So let's say that a web browser has been written, but how do you get it? And there are lots of different ways. It's not just like Windows or Mac OS where there is one kind of standardized way. You have these things called a package and a package manager. 
and a package will install with dependencies. So if a program is relying on another open source project, you have to install the first one first, and then you install the second one, which depends on it. And there are various different packages. Uh, the, the Debian and the Ubuntu uh, packages are .deb files, and those are supported by those and all the variations of those OSs. OK, and then you've got the kind of the Fedora and Red Hat way, and that's an RPM, R, Red Hat P package manager, Red Hat package manager. So that's a different way of doing it. And they're not compatible with each other. Uh, you can't, you know, that you, you use Debian packages on Debian, you use Fedora and Red Hat RPMs on on those operating system. Arch has got a different one called called Pac-Man. Then there are self-contained packages like App images, snaps, and flat packs. These are these provide a way of all of the software that you need being put under one kind of directory, very much like how Mac OS does things. Uh, and uh, they're all there. So when you pick a Linux distro, you're also investing in this kind of package system as well. So the huge number of combinations of these different components means there are a massive number of Linux distribution. So you can have an Ubuntu with a Mate desktop or you can have an Ubuntu with KDE desktop and then you could be using flat packs rather than using .deb files or you could be using a different networking something or a different security update. I mean that you can literally, in a different Linux kernel, you can literally mix and match these and there are just so many combinations and that's why there are so many uh, lots and lots of Linux distributions. And this leads to lots of choice, good thing, lots of confusion, bad thing. The existence of so many Linux distros is simultaneously the source of Linux greatest strength and its greatest weakness. So if you say, oh, I got my family member or my colleague or my friend to switch to Linux, well, that's great, but they may have switched to Ubuntu rather than switching to something else. And then they come along and someone else says, oh, I use Linux as well. And then, of course, it all looks completely different because the different package manager, different desktop operating system, different underlying tools, different Linux kernel version, you know, it, it can be very, very confusing. So what are the best Linux distros for beginners? So my first recommendation would be go to Ubuntu. I consider it the de facto standard. It's stable, well known, and has a huge community. You can't go wrong by installing uh, Ubuntu. You're not going to be left sort of with like no support and no future versions and you don't know what's happening and there's no community. This is really going to be very easy. And here is a picture of Ubuntu running. It's kind of got this side de uh, bar here start button kind of down here and then this would be a typical window open up here up here is your your start uh, and shut down button but that's the kind of way it looks now as i say because there's so many different desktop environments one thing you'll notice is that as we go through these distros they all look very different so that's that's part of the uh, as i said the choice but also the weakness manjaro would is a user-friendly intuitive uh, Linux distro with a good installation process, good hardware detection. Now it uses this rolling model release, which means that uh, you don't just get uh, you know the next version with Ubuntu. There's always another version every six months. With this one, it's kind of it's the same version. It just gets updated incrementally, sometimes even on a on a daily basis. And there are other distros like that as well. So different way of doing it. Uh, and this is what uh, Manjaro looks like. Again, it's a desktop, so of course you get Windows, you get a start menu, you get desktop icons, there's a clock, there's a shutdown button. It's just a question of where they are and what the theme is and how it all kind of fits together. And then Pop OS, I, I like this one as well. You Ubuntu based with a custom GNOME desktop from a, a Linux company called System76. Now they make Linux computers, Linux desktops, Linux servers, Linux uh, laptops, and they have this version of Pop OS because it's kind of their offering. So that's good because there's a business behind it, there's a commercial operation behind it, and they're offering this OS to go with their hardware. So it is Linux, it is based on Ubuntu, but it's got their twist to it. And they've got a huge uh, set of online videos and documentation to help people get started. And here is a picture of uh, Pop OS. I do have uh, at least one Pop OS video here on this channel, just going through quickly uh, how it all kind of fits together. Now, again, you see here the the, the start bar is in the middle there, kind of like Windows 11 uh, and, and so on. So it's just about the theme and the styling. And then, of course, the toolkit, as I mentioned earlier, that's used to create it. Now, of course, there's going to be lots of people who immediately jump down to the comments and say, why didn't you mention? And then they'll be mentioning their favorite Linux distro. So I'll do a few more notable mentions here. There are, of course, others. As I said, there is so much choice. Uh, and I'm really just trying to reduce that level of choice so that people have a target. 
because if you say here's a hundred Linux distros, pick one, that's not very helpful. So Elementary OS, Endeavor M uh, OS, MX Linux, Zorin OS is very popular. Linux Mint, again, very popular. They're all good uh, operating systems, all good versions of uh, Linux for for beginners. Uh, pick one and uh, and take a dive. I'll also just talk briefly about experienced users and IT experts. If you're an experienced Linux user, then in one sense you don't need my recommendations because you already have that experience, so I'm pretty sure you have your favorite distro. However, if you are an IT expert, so you're very tech savvy, uh, so you're happy to get your hands a bit dirty, you're happy to do things, then there are some other distros that we could mention. Debian is the, uh, the source really of many uh, Linux desktop. Ubuntu is based on Debian and then Debian is there uh, as a thing itself. So it's stable, community driven, known for its commitment to free software. It doesn't like including anything that's not free, e even in a binary blob for a drive or something like that. It's, it's like, no, no, we want to keep everything as open source as possible. Extensive packages available uh, and there is uh, a Debian running there. Uh, on the desktop running GNOME, of course. So uh, again, same kind of thing. You're always going to see a window <laughs> and then way to in ways to interact with that desktop. OpenSUSE is a very good one as well, known for its flexibility, multiple desktop environments suitable for both desktop and servers. And here's a picture of that running. And Arch Linux, you have to have that if you're doing a Linux uh, list of distribution. Lightweight, rolling release, like I mentioned earlier on. Very much a DIY approach, popular amongst advanced Linux users who prefer a hands-on approach to setting up the system. Basically, you've set up a lot of it yourself, uh, but Arch gives you that, that ability. And here is Arch running with a KDE in this particular instance. And then the final one I'd like to mention is uh, Kali Linux, because that is specifically designed for ethical hackers, network penetration, cybersecurity professionals. So it comes pre-installed with a whole bunch of tools. So if your job is to maintain your network uh, in an organization, and you also want the tools to help you manage that network, and also the tools to help test that network, its robustness, uh, and so on. There are a whole bunch of tools that come uh, in Kali Linux as well by default. And some people say you can still use it as your main uh, desktop Linux distribution as well, because it doesn't just give you the command. And of course, it comes with a desktop and so on. So uh, often the choice there of uh, professionals. And here is uh, Kali Linux running uh, there. Again, lots of ones that people say, why didn't you mention this? Alpine Linux, very popular because it's not built uh, using the GNU tool. So it's GNU free, that's very popular. Gentoo, uh, Slackware, because it's been around literally for decades. Uh, Nix OS. So all of these are good ones that you might want to try. Now, some of you are saying, why haven't I mentioned anything that's in the Red Hat or Fedora line? And there are various uh, versions of that, including, of course, Red Hat and Fedora, well, following Red Hat's decision to no longer release the source code for its distro, then I no longer recommend any distros that help Red Hat in its goals. So basically, no Red Hat from me. Okay, where to start? If you're new to Linux, what should be your first step? Now, you've chosen one. Let's say you've opted for Ubuntu. What should your first step be? There are four ways to test, try, use a Linux distribution. Install it directly on a PC. Uh, on your main PC, if you're sure of the way forward and there's no better way than just to jump in feet first, but please, please, please make sure you have a backup of all of your data because once you install it, uh, depending on how you install it, but the chances are it's just going to overwrite the operating system you've already got there. So you'll lose, let's say, Windows and you'll lose all your documents. You can dual boot, which means you get both of them and you get a menu at the beginning to say, do you want to boot into Linux? Do you want to boot into Windows? But if you're installing this on your main PC, please, please, please make sure you have a copy of everything that you need from that PC. Another, maybe slightly safer way, would be to install it on some kind of spare PC. Uh, a good way to try Linux, no danger of losing your data. You get time to play with it. It's kind of sitting to the side. Uh, you can probably pick up a, a relatively decent uh, secondhand desktop from 50 to to $100. Then you just plug in an extra keyboard and a mouse. Hopefully you may be able to pick up a secondhand screen if you haven't got a secondhand monitor. But, you know, for $100 or, you know, around about there, you could have a second PC up and running and then you just can play around with it and learn without jeopardizing your main current workflows. 
You can install it in a virtual machine. So use virtual machine software like Hyper-V or VirtualBox. So that runs on your existing desktop. And I have a fun video on here when I show a virtual machine running inside a virtual machine running inside a virtual machine. If that's, I found that quite interesting. So it's a safe way to learn Linux because you just run it there inside that window on your main desktop. You can learn all about how it's done, the packages, the networking, the desktop environment, applications, how you install everything. And it's safe because it's just there inside of that virtual machine. And then the, a final way I recommend is you can boot from directly from the USB. So many Linux distributions, including Ubuntu, allow you to boot from a USB and then use Linux from the USB without installing it. And then when you shut it down and pull out the USB, you get back your old PC. It's often called a live uh, distro. And here, for example, when you boot up Ubuntu, you do get this option here, try Ubuntu which doesn't make any changes to your computer. Okay, you, you can install it, but if you do try, then it just runs from the USB. Here they say from, from the CD. Uh, and in fact, I did that literally uh, yesterday. I needed to do something on a PC. I wanted to get access to it via Ubuntu. I booted it up, used the try Ubuntu, did the thing I wanted to do, and then when I shut it down again, of course, it was able to reboot up into Windows afterwards. Okay, that's it. So my name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Love to hear from you in the comments about uh, have you tried uh, Linux? Are you going to try it in 2024? And please do let me know how you get on. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.